Hello, St. Peter's, and welcome back to our chapter book series. Today, we are going to continue our adventures with the Littles, which we started last week, and we'll finish up next week. We're getting very close to Easter and spring break at St. Peter's School, so I'll be sure to finish this next Monday so you can have a whole spring break before we start our next adventure. What do you say? Are you ready? We've got our friends here, Ralph, Magic Monkey, Daisy over here, and here's our Pig of Joy sitting right up on the shelf with her jar of joy. They're having a great day. It's so sunny outside. The sun is spilling into the library, so we're having a lot of fun here at school. I hope you're having fun and will get some time to go outside and enjoy this beautiful sunny weather. All right, should we get to it? Remember, our book is The Littles, and Father Little just came in, Mr. Little, just came in panicking because he saw a mouse, right? And remember, they're so small. This is a cat and they're so tiny. They're less than six inches. So a mouse is very large and a mouse actually did come and attack them in, in the past, but their uncle was in that battle and he lost his brother in that battle. So that's why they're very scared of these mice. Let's see what happens. <clears throat> We're starting with chapter six. Every night for a week, Mr. Little and Tom watched the Newcombs at dinner time. Mr. Little wanted to find out if the Newcombs had seen the mice and what, if anything, they were doing to get rid of them. Tom and his father hid high above the dinner table in a secret lookout place near the ceiling light. They could see everything that went on in the room. <clears throat> Below them, the Newcombs were finishing their dinner. I saw a hummingbird outside the study window today, said Mrs. Newcomb. I was feeding, uh, it was feeding on the iris. Oh, marvelous, said Mr. Newcomb. Would you mind passing the butter? That's a rare thing to see, you know. They're so tiny and timid. Oh, and fast, said Mrs. Newcomb. I moved closer to the window for a better look, and it was gone in a flash. Mr. Newcomb sipped his coffee. Mmm, dear, don't you think this coffee is a bit weak again? Mrs. Newcomb nodded. What's the bird that sounds like a rusty iron gate? Above them, the littles listened. The Newcombs talked about many things, but as usual, neither one said anything about the mice. Let's go, said Mr. Little to Tom. They haven't seen any mice. And here you can see their lookout. See above the chandelier, so the Newcombs wouldn't see them. That's pretty cool. Father and son climbed out of the lookout place. They walked across the ceiling between the rafters. They even put it on the top of the page. That's pretty clever. So they're walking high above the rafters. Both were armed. Tom was carrying a bow and a quiver full of arrows. Mr. Little had a sword. He was carrying a lighted candle. What can we do, said Tom. The Newcomb see birds everywhere outside the house. But inside where the mice are, they never see anything. Are they blind or something? Mr. Little sighed. Huh. I don't know, he said. Mice are quick animals. They're not easy to see, and they usually do most of their work when people are not around. Hey, I have an idea, said Tom Little. I know how we can get them to see the mice. How? It's easy. We can... Just then, Tom's father stopped. Tom, following close behind, bumped into him. The candle fell from Mr. Little's hand and went out. Mr. Little reached for his sword. Is it a mouse? whispered Tom. Shh! Quietly, Tom took an arrow and fitted it to the bowstring. There was a scratching noise in the wall ahead. Mr. Little and Tom stood still and tried to see into the blackness. They listened. When Mr. Little had heard enough to know it was a mouse, he whispered to Tom, I'll stand here. You hide behind that heating pipe. As soon as the mouse reaches the top of the wall, I'll light a match. He took a deep breath. If he runs to attack me, shoot him with your bow and arrow. Don't shoot unless he attacks. The light might frighten him away. 
What if I miss? said Tom. I have the sword, said Mr. Little. The mouse will have to get awfully close for you to use the sword, said Tom. That's why you better not miss with the arrow, said Mr. Little. Now go. Tom Little felt his way through the dark ceiling to the pipe. He drew the arrow across the bow and pulled the string back with all his might. Then he aimed into the darkness toward the sound of the scratching. The noise grew louder and louder. From the sound of it, Tom thought the mouse was climbing near the Little's tin can elevator. He hoped the mouse hadn't gnawed through the string. The boy had never seen a mouse. He had, of course, heard many scary stories about them. He was ready for something terrible. Suddenly, there was a burst of blinding white light. His father's match. Shadows danced. Tom Little blinked. Then he saw the mouse. It was climbing up over the edge of the wall. Its eyes were like little black mirrors shining back the light of the match. Tom forgot what his father had told him. Instead, he didn't wait for the mouse to attack. Instead, as soon as he saw the beast, he shot the arrow. It flew through the air and struck the mouse in the foreleg. The mouse squealed. Oh my goodness, there he is. See him with his little bow and arrow? Mouse does look scary. If, you, if there was a mouse that big coming at you, you'd be scared too. This is so exciting. Ah, oh, nuts, yelled Tom. I forgot. He shot another arrow. By that time, the mouse had climbed over the wall. As it struggled to its feet, the second arrow hit it in the rump. It squealed louder. The arrows didn't stop the mouse. It crawled toward the light. A low, snarling growl came from deep in its throat. Mr. Little stood his ground in the middle of the ceiling space four feet away from the oncoming mouse. In one hand, he held the sword at arm's length, pointed at the mouse. In the other hand, he held the burning match high over his head like a torch. Then he lowered the match torch and pointed it at the mouse. Suddenly the mouse turned and limped away. Whew, he was scared of the fire. Thank goodness he had that match. Mr. Little, and this is chapter seven, sorry. Mr. Little and Tom were not the only Littles who fought with mice that day. Uncle Pete and Lucy had a narrow escape in the cellar. So the cellar is like a basement. They had been burning trash at the hot water heater when two mice trapped them. Uncle Pete and Lucy were under the water tank next to the burner and there was no safe way out. Here they are. That one's trapping Lucy. Sure does look scary to me, doesn't it? At first, Uncle Pete tried to fight them off with his bow and arrows, but the old bowstring broke with the first shot and he missed. Luckily, Uncle Pete had made two torches from burnt matches he found near the heater. He had wrapped rags around the ends of the matchsticks and then he dipped them in a puddle of oil near the furnace. When the bowstring broke, Uncle Pete lit the torches. He and Lucy waved them at the mice and frightened them away. Back in the safety of their rooms, Uncle Pete made a new bowstring. He waxed it carefully and strung it on the bow. Oh, someone's going to get hurt if this keeps up, said Mrs. Little. When are the newcomers going to help us? Probably never, said Uncle Pete. Oh, Tom has a plan, said Mr. Little. It's a good plan and I think it will work. Tell your idea, Tom. Well, said Tom, those newcomers never see the mice, so they don't bother to set traps, right? Tom's mother nodded. Suppose we show them a mouse. Then they'll know, right? How do we do that? Said Uncle Pete. We don't have any mice. Your mouse got away and my bowstring broke. We don't want them to see a dead mouse anyway, said Mr. Little. Then what on earth is the boy talking about? Said Uncle Pete. Get to the point. Suppose I dressed up like a mouse, said Tom. I could run across the kitchen floor right in front of Mrs. Newcomb. Good heavens, said Uncle Pete. Is the woman an idiot? Couldn't she tell a fake mouse from a real one? If the fake mouse went fast enough, said Mrs. Little, she might think it was real. 
Well, there's only one thing wrong with Tom's plan, said Mr. Little. I'll do the mouse running. As head of the family, it's my job. But Dad, you're too big, said Tom. I'm just the right size. It won't look right if you do it. Oh dear, said Mrs. Little. Do you think so? Ah, the boy's right, said Uncle Pete. If we're going to use his plan, let's do it right. He's the perfect size for this job. It was decided. Tom would play the part of the mouse. Mr. Little would go with him to tell him when and where to run. Granny Little set to work, making the costume. By the next afternoon, they were ready. Tom was dressed in the costume. He looked quite a lot like a real mouse, even from close up. Granny Little had done her work well. She had sewed on ears and whiskers, and Tom used his own tail, of course. His mother oiled and brushed down the hair so that it had the shape of a mouse's tail. And here it is. So here's Granny making it, and here's Tom with his mother working on his tail, wearing it. He does look like a mouse, doesn't he? Boy, oh boy, I hope this plan works. Tom, you look a fright, said Mr. Little. Uncle Pete came into the room. Ha <laughs> Mrs. Newcomb's in the kitchen now, he said. It's time you two get moving. Just a minute, just a minute, said Granny Little. She was on her knees making some last minute changes. It's too loose around the ankles. You don't want him to trip, do you? Lucy stood behind her mother, sneaking looks at Tom. Mother, doesn't he look awful? She said. I want to see myself in the mirror, said Tom. Hold still, hold still, said Granny Little. She worked for a moment longer. There, she stood up and looked at her work. Granny, it's wonderful, said Mrs. Little. It's awful, said Lucy. The family followed Tom as he squeaked and galloped on all fours over to the mirror. Tom, said Mr. Little, this is not a joke. I want you to remember that. I'm practicing, said Tom. The boy is high spirited, that's all, said Uncle Pete. I was that way myself when I was his age. Mr. Little had come to pull his son away from the mirror. Come, Tom, he said, we're wasting time. Mrs. Newcomb may not be in the kitchen for long. All the Littles went with Mr. Little and Tom down the passageway as far as the tin can elevator. Mrs. Little tried to kiss Tom, but the mouse costume covered his head. Instead, she pulled his tail gently. Be careful, Tom. Do just as your father tells you, she said. He'll be all right, said Mr. Little. He knows what to do. We've gone over it and over it. What's all the fuss, said Uncle Pete. They'll be back shortly. Mr. Little and Tom climbed into the tin can. They had rigged up a tin can elevator from an old soup can and bits of string tied together. And the elevator dropped slowly out of sight. Here's a picture of that tin can elevator. So you can see here's Mr. Little up here and he put Tom in the elevator to go down. So it's on a pulley up there and the string comes down and takes the tin can down. Then he can get out when he goes there and they can always pull it back up when he's ready. Pretty cool. Oh, it's the first time any of the big people have ever seen any of us, said Mrs. Little. And the only real part of Tom they'll see is, is his tail. Down in the kitchen, Mr. Little hid behind a wastebasket. He got ready to give Tom the signal to go. The tiny man held up his hand, waiting for the right moment. If Mrs. Newcomb was too close, she might step on Tom. But if she weren't facing the right way, she might not see Tom run across the floor. Mr. Little waited. Tom watched his father carefully. Mrs. Newcomb turned toward the wastebasket where Mr. Little was hiding. Mr. Little's hand dropped. Just then, Mrs. Newcomb started walking. No, Tom, wait, whispered Mr. Little. Too late. Tom Little came skittering across the kitchen floor, just in time to run between Mrs. Newcomb's feet. Mr. Little closed his eyes. Eee! shouted Mrs. Newcomb. A mouse! <laughs> Mr. Little opened his eyes. Tom was safe under the radiator on the other side of the room. Charlie, 
shouted Mrs. Newcomb. There's a mouse in the kitchen! Mr. Newcomb came running. This house has mice, said Mrs. Newcomb. One of them almost jumped on me. Take it easy, Liz, said Mr. Newcomb. He got down on his knees and looked around. Charlie, you must get rid of the mice, said Mrs. Newcomb. I won't live in a house with mice. We'll get rid of them, said Mr. Newcomb. The bigs must have mouse traps around someplace. Just don't get too excited, Liz. It's only a little mouse. Don't get excited, you say, said Mrs. Newcomb. You should have seen it. It ran straight at me. It might have bitten me. Oh, it came so close. You think a mouse would bite you, said Mr. Newcomb. Oh, you can't tell, said Mrs. Newcomb. You never can tell what a wild animal like that will do. And here's a picture of Tom running right between her feet. That would be a little unnerving, don't you think? I might get a little scared about that. And here's Tom looking like a mouse. <laughs> All right, one more chapter. We'll read chapter eight. The Littles were very pleased with the success of Tom's plan. Mr. Little couldn't get over it. Oh, I wish you all could have seen Tom, he said. Zip, he went right across the floor. It's a mouse, yelled Mrs. Newcomb. Oh my, it was something to see. He's a little all right, said Uncle Pete. He has that little bravery. I only had a... I only had a little bravery is right, Uncle Pete, said Tom. I was kind of scared. All the littles laughed, except Uncle Pete. Tom Little, you ripped this mouse costume, said Granny Little. She was looking at it under a light. I'm sorry, Granny, said Tom. I was going so fast I couldn't stop when I got to the other side of the room. I tore on a nail under the radiator. I'll fix it, said Granny Little. You can wear it next Halloween. Oh, I hate mice, said Lucy. Don't wear that thing ever again, please. Granny, you did a wonderful job on the costume, said Mr. Little. But, well, no one really likes it. Do you know what I mean? No sense in wasting all that good work, said Granny Little. She started sewing. We may need it again. I'm not leaving my room until the mice are gone, said Lucy. They'll be gone in a few days, Mr. Little said Mr. Little. You'll see. Everything is going to be all right now. I say we should give Newcomb a helping hand, said Uncle Pete. He picked up a sword made from one of Mrs. Biggs's needles. On guard! Uncle Pete limped forward, waving the sword and stabbing it in the air. Take that and that! And there he is, Uncle Pete with his needle sword. Oh, goodness, Uncle Pete, do put that thing down, said Mrs. Little. I hate to see those weapons around. She turned to her husband. When can we put them back in the chest? As soon as the mice are gone, said Mr. Little. I figure a few days at most. In the meantime, I want all of you to watch out for the mouse traps. We don't want any accidents now that our troubles are almost over. We'd, why don't we stay in our rooms for the next few days, said Mrs. Little. Then we'll be safe from the traps and the mice. Uncle Pete didn't think so. We should know what's going on at all times, he said. Bad business sticking your head in the sand like an ostrich. Let's look around once a day then, said Mr. Little. That should be enough. I'm going down to the kitchen first thing tomorrow morning, said Uncle Pete. I want to see those mouse traps with my own eyes. May I go with you, Uncle Pete, this time? said Tom. Lucy doesn't want to go, do you, Lucy? I am not leaving my room until the mice are gone, said Lucy Little for the second time. She is not happy with these mice. She doesn't even like that costume. See how scared she looks? I don't blame her. That could be scary. And that is where we're going to end for today. We'll finish the book tomorrow or not tomorrow, next week, starting with chapter nine, The Littles by John Peterson. Wow, what an adventure they had today. Could you imagine if you had to go with your bow and arrow and a sword in your own house to try to protect yourselves? They are very creative, and it was a good thing they used that match.
because that's what the mice were really scared of, weren't they? The fire in it. I wonder how it's going to turn out. Do you think they'll catch all the mice? And finally, the littles will be safe again in their home? That's what I'm hoping for. We'll have to find out next time. In the meantime, what do you say? We spread some joy. What do you say, Joy? I think she's ready. Come on down. We'll shake up our joy jar. Remember, if you have any other good ideas for our jar of joy, put them in the comments and I will add them to our jar. Right, Joy? All right, let's see what we're going to do today. It says, Joy's all turned around. Read to someone. I love it. Read to someone. Like I just read to you, did you have some fun? Yeah. Did you get excited and maybe a little nervous? But it gets you excited and happy that someone is sitting reading to you. So you can spread that joy just like I did. Find a book that you love. Ask someone to sit down and read to them. Maybe a younger brother or sister. Maybe an older brother or sister. Or even your parents. You could even read to your parents as they're doing another job. Like maybe your dad's folding the laundry and you could read to him. Maybe your mom's cooking dinner. You could read to her or vice versa. The best way to read to someone is to get your friends, get the person you love, snuggle up together on the couch in your bed, somewhere cozy in a big chair in your living room, get your book and read together. Maybe they need to read some of the words for you and maybe you can read some of the words yourself. Reading to someone will definitely make you, not only them, but you happy too. So you'll be full of joy and so will they. That's a good one, Joy. And then after you're done reading, you can go outside and play. That's what we're gonna do now. Well, not yet. We still have to put some books away before school's over and then we'll play after school. How about you? All right, everyone, we will be back next week for the conclusion of the littles. Until then, enjoy the sunshine and don't forget, keep spreading your joy.